sophomore at Stanford, as you can tell by the accent, not from the US originally. Uh, so my question is about your argument from the developing world's perspective and how it's immoral for the West to essentially, for the lack of a better phrase, tell us what to do. But my question to you is regarding fossil fuels. Um, nine, of, nine out of 10 people today breathe polluted air as according to WHO standards. I missed nine out of 10 people uh, breathe polluted air okay. as per the WH standards. And looking at India, for example, where I'm from, every time I go back there, I hack up a lung the minute I step out of the airplane because of how bad the AQI is. So my question is, how do you justify not using, uh, or rather the US working with these countries to diversify their energy supply, if for nothing else, to prevent the sort of lung damage that this pollution has caused systematically? Right. Thank you. So, good. So, so, what you're really talking about is local pollution, which is terrible. Okay? Agreed. However, we have the technology to control that. If you look, for example, here in the U.S., I lived in Los Angeles when I was at Caltech for 30 years. Okay? And during that time, the population of the L.A. Basin doubled, but the PM 2.5, if you want to take that as a measure, went down significantly because of catalytic converters, control on coal-fired sources, and so on. So we have the technology to control local pollution. You just have to implement it. It costs money, okay? but we have it. Um, good morning, Stephen. My, my name is Karina, and actually, I'm a uh, native of Los Angeles City, so I live in the jurisdiction of Los Angeles City, where uh, politicians and nonprofit organizations really talk about climate, the climate change crisis, but they also have, uh, yeah, they're, they're saying it's a climate crisis, but also an environmental justice issue, and um, that's a narrative that we're hearing where I live. Um, so Governor Newsom has a 2035 plan to make uh, California the first state that would stop the sale of uh, gas cars. Um, if I wanted to do a cost-benefit analysis and specifically uh, looking at disadvantaged communities, where could I start this research and to educate the, on the other perspective? Well, um, I don't know if it's another perspective, but if I would have try to do that, right? I'd look at the mobility needs of, as a function of income, uh, if you want to talk about poor folks. Um, I would look at the costs, and then I would, uh, of vehicles, and right now, electric vehicles cost a lot more than um, uh, internal combustion engines, and um, have somewhat downsides in their operating characteristics. Uh, and then I would look at how do I improve the general welfare of that uh, lower income strata. And my guess is it's mobility that they need uh, and any reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Look, I mean, how can you say that making California zero emissions, right, is gonna directly help those folks? It's not, of course. The best way to help them is to bring them up to the standard of living that the upper half of California needs. That's most direct and probably cheapest. Right. I think that's the argument. And it's true for the globe as a whole as well, right? Hi, my name is uh, Sadie Bowen. I, I'm sorry, I can't see where you are. Hello. Oh, I see okay. you. Very good. Um, Thank you. Hi, my name is Sadie Golan. Um, I heard you mentioned the Maui wildfires. I'm sure we've all been hearing about that in the news. Um, floods in Vermont, tons of um, extreme natural disasters, heat waves, droughts, floods, et cetera, that have been happening over the last couple years, couple decades. And as we know, climate policy is often used to respond to these disasters as well as prepare for these disasters. So if you think that climate change has no effect on these events, how do you... Um, propose that we use policy to prepare and respond to these disasters. So let's take Maui as an example, right? Lahaina. When you look at the analysis, it was due to three factors, okay? One is a progressive invasion of Hawaiian fields that were once used for sugarcane and are now lying fallow, the invasion by various grass species. And those species 
have the characteristic that they grow in the wintertime on the west side of Maui. And we had a particularly wet winter this last winter in, in Maui. So they grew up a lot. And then every year, like clockwork, they dry out. And so you got a lot of fuel there, first of all. Okay. The second is you need wind. And there were particularly strong, although not unprecedented, trade winds that were blowing over the last couple of weeks in Maui. And then the third thing is you need an ignition source. And the power system in Maui is notoriously prone to the wires coming down. And if they didn't cut the power in the wires, which they didn't do, then you've got a wonderful ignition source. So those three human factors, well, the wind you can't control, but the grass you certainly can, and the power you can, and the fact that the buildings were not particularly fireproof, um, that's how you fix those things with policy. The same is true here in California. Forestry practices were abysmal in this state. The governor has woken up to that fact over the last couple of years. PG&E um, spent a lot of money um, on um, renewables, uh, but not on clearing the power lines. Again, they're subject to the whims of the PUC. And then finally, building towns like Paradise in the middle of the forest is not a particularly safe thing to do either. So there are human actions, policy actions, you can take to prevent wildfire disasters. Uh, howdy. Uh, my name is Clay Noble, and I go to Texas A&M, and I study agriculture and natural resource economics. Um, this summer, I got to work for ExxonMobil, and one of the things that was really emphasized to us is that it's an and equation. So both meeting the world's demand for energy through current fossil fuels, but then also investing excess capital into innovative technologies. So my question is, uh, you mentioned that a gradual decarbonization approach through technology like CCS. Um, there are studies that show the public is mistrustful of that or just ill-informed on some of those really innovative yet technical opportunities. So how can the private sector or corporations uh, both inform policymakers and then the general public about these opportunities that are often very technical in nature? Yeah. One of the dysfunctions of the current scene is that uh, if you know something, like you're an industry uh, or you're an expert on power system or whatever, you're discounted and do not have a seat at the policy tables. I know that. I was one of the things in my bio which was not mentioned. I was for five years the chief scientist for BP, the oil company. All right? And so I had a kind of inside seat into how the big energy companies respond to um, decarbonization and how they do or do not influence policy. And I can tell you that even now, 15 or 20 years after I left, 15 years after I left BP, um, they're still afraid to speak up. Right? They will say, yes, yes, we're researching and so on. Uh, but in fact, some of the facts I told you about uh, which are just facts, uh, they're not afraid, uh, they are afraid to say in public. I think, you know, the situation will fix itself in the sense that as, if you try to go too fast, these restrictions are going to bite and people are going to say, wait a second, uh, why are we going so fast and what about these technologies? You see it already with nuclear okay, fission, um, more acceptable now in the public discussion than it was 10 years ago because people are starting to understand if you want an emissions-free, reliable grid, nuclear power plants are going to be really important in that future. So slowly, slowly, techno-economic realities uh, dominate. Well, thank you for the talk. So my question is about using um, how we can benchmark the the impact of climate change. So um, in the first part of the lecture, you talked about a lot of um, climate variables, but you showed um, their averages don't, um, didn't really change much. 
but I'm wondering whether it would be better if we use variance as another measure, because in the case of climate change, what actually matters is like the low probability, um, but very high damage events like the extreme weather. Um, and also like if you average over the countries, every country, some countries might be um, getting hotter and some countries might be getting colder. So when you're averaging them up, you don't really get a lot of changes. Right. So do you think, yeah. what do you think about so, it? So those are excellent points. Um, you know, it's very hard to predict extreme events because they don't happen very often. Um, and often they have a small spatial scale. Um, the drought in the Midwest might be a couple hundred kilometers, well, more than a couple, 500 kilometers on a side. Uh, it's localized. And the models have a hard time with that kind of spatial resolution. Um, one thing you can say is that extreme events happen all the time. Somebody in the back, in a previous question, remarked about the growing number of extreme events. Well, you know, if you ask how often does an extreme event happen anywhere in the world, the answer is a couple times a month, whether it's drought, flood, storm, et cetera. And so the media can pick this stuff up and make it look like it's happening more and more. You have to look at the data, and you have to look at the data over a couple decades, at least, to see if anything is changing. I think on a decadal scale, we've not seen any changes so far in the variance. Right? For hurricanes, for example, are no more frequent. So your point is a good one, but the data just aren't there right now, and it's really hard to model that stuff. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Charles from the University of Washington. Hi, Charles. And uh, yeah, uh, I love physics and I love your work. And I always love the sparring that you have with people from Scientific American. But my <laughs> question to you is uh, what are the key limitations or challenges in climate models that lead to these inaccurate pro projections? And how can these limitations be addressed to yeah. improve accuracy right. of future climate predictions? Right. So, so great question. Um, there's a little bit of that in the book if you've, you've read it. Um, so how can we make the, why are the models so bad and can we make them better, if I could paraphrase, right? So you've got to ask, how do we build these models? And the way in which you do that is you cover the Earth with a grid, squares, typically 100 kilometers on a side. And then you build layers in those squares, say 20 layers up into the atmosphere and 10 or 20 layers down into the ocean. And then you use the basic laws of physics, conservation of energy, momentum, matter, and so on, to track the air, the water vapor, the pollution, um, the um, radiation, sunlight and heat radiation, through those boxes as they move around. 10 minutes at a time, okay? And you gotta do that for a couple centuries at least. Now the problem is, if you make the boxes 100 kilometers on a side, which is kind of the state of the art, you get a couple of 10, you get about 10 million boxes that you gotta follow. And you gotta follow them 10 minutes at a time for a couple centuries, big, big computer problem, okay? Takes the world's fastest computers running for months to do one simulation. The simulations that get done do not agree with each other. And the reason they don't agree is that within those boxes, 100 kilometers on a side, there's lots going on. Clouds, for example, are a few kilometers on a side. You cannot describe that detail within just one large box. And so you gotta make assumptions. If the humidity is this and the temperature is that, the clouds are so much, for example. Right? Um, different people make different assumptions, and so you get different answers. You might say, well, let's make the boxes, this is such an important problem, let's shrink the boxes down to 10 kilometers on a side. Well, if you do that, then the computational load goes up by a factor of 1,000. 
So you need a thousand times more powerful computer than you got today. And yes, computers are getting better, but it's going to be a long time before they get a thousand times better. So that's the problem. And you might ask, how do we fix that besides faster computers? There are people trying to use, uh, of course, these days, AI, machine learning, to say, it, can I learn if the conditions in the box are such and such, how many clouds will be there, and that sort of thing. So application of machine learning technologies is currently, I would say, a promising area that's being investigated. Um. Dr. Coonan, thanks so much for being here. My name's Josiah. I'm a junior here at Stanford from Washington State. Um, so Alex Epstein argues that the drastic climate alarmism, or as he calls it, climate catastrophizing, um, stems from this anti-human framework that prioritizes the preservation of the environment as the highest moral good rather than prioritizing uh, human flourishing uh, framework. So given the data on the benefits of um, fossil fuels, uh, given the data on climate change, what do you think is the underlying reason that there has been such pushback um, or such climate alarmism, climate catastrophizing policies? Yeah. Um let me just say first, for those of you who don't know, Alex Epstein is a philosopher by training and writes about uh, the importance of fossil fuels. When uh, I first heard about him, um, I said, what's a philosopher going to say about this that's of any use? <laughs> Typical physicist attitude, right? Uh, I've gotten to know Alex. I consider him a friend. And uh, he's got a lot to say. And so um, I learned a lot from him. Um, why is climate alarmism so prevalent? Um, I think it is uh, not a conspiracy, but an alignment of interests among different factions. So the media, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, and so weather stories, as opposed to climate, uh, are wonderful for getting clicks and eyeballs. Politicians, I like to quote H.L. Mencken, uh, who in the 1920s, or maybe even a bit earlier, said the purpose of practical politics is to keep the electorate alarmed by a series of mostly imaginary hobgoblins so that they can be clamoring to be led to safety. And you see the politicians do that not only for climate, but for immigration on the other side, for uh, some of that we saw in COVID, I believe, um, many issues keep the public alarmed. Missile gap, those of you, none of you were old enough to know all about that, but that was a fear of the Soviet Union in the early 60s or 1950s. Um, so that's the politicians. For the NGOs, if you have, um, set up your NGO with the purpose of saving the Earth, uh, and suddenly the science says, it's not such a big deal. Uh, you're not so happy about that. And finally, the scientists, the working level scientists, I find, are pretty uh, honest when you sit and talk with them. But by the time it gets to the summaries for policymakers and then on to the press releases, it gets terribly distorted. So there are motivations for everybody to kind of not tell the truth or to tell half-truths about this. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. I appreciate it. All right, good.